I'm delighted to introduce myself, Valerie Owen Levayant. I'm the master of the Worshipful Company of Chartered Architects, which is a livery company in the City of London. Architecture is one of the oldest professions in the world, and the ROBA received its Royal Charter from King William IV in 1837. Esteemed architects like Sir Christopher Wren rebuilt the City of London after the Great Fire in 1666 and work started on our great cathedral, St Paul's, in 1675. And when it was completed, it remained the tallest building in the capital for over 300 years. The City of London is the ancient core from which the rest of London developed and it's governed by the oldest local authority in the world. Some livery companies are around 900 years old. They evolve from London's medieval guilds and many have royal charters and take responsibility for training and for regulation in their respective trades. But despite being an old profession, we are a young, modern, vibrant livery company established in 1984 when eight founding fathers got together in the Institute's 150th anniversary year and formed our company. We were granted livery status in 1988. Our architects have not only built the rich heritage of the city, but also its sparkling new spires. The Architects Company has grown exponentially over the last five years because it is relevant. Our members include stellar award-winning architects from many of the leading practices in the UK. They're widely acknowledged for their design excellence, both nationally and internationally, as well as past and serving presidents. The company supports a range of charities related to the City of London, and it also promotes architecture, notably through its acclaimed City of the Bu Building of the Year Award, its annual lecture, and its promotion of London as the global hub for creativity. Architecture apprenticeships were launched by REBA in late 2018, and this is the current theme for the architects' company, because apprenticeships are our future. They fit well with the charitable focus of the architects' company on education and resonate with the traditional purpose of the London Guilds, which have supported apprentices for over 500 years. It also supports a range of charities, including the Architects' Benevolence Society and the Royal Academy's Attract programme. The Lord Mayor's Appeal, Open House Weekend, and prizes for art at the four City of London schools. We also actively participate in the Livery Schools Link, Team Build Competition, and so it's particularly fitting that the theme for my year as master is architecture apprenticeships. The company promotes architecture in the City of London through its annual City Building of the Year Award, presenting to the building which is deemed to have made the most significant contribution to the streetscape and the skyline of the City of London. We were, of course, delighted to collaborate with the Worshipful Company of Wax Chandlers on their Pollinating London Together programme, because sustainability is at the heart of our agenda for the built environment. And there is no doubt this is a really important agenda. We need offices for humans to work in, but we have to balance the human demands with the needs of nature and of environment. Carbon reduction, human well-being, working effectively, planting and nature now and for the future. So thank you Chris Dyson for joining me here in Finsbury Circus. So you are an architect in the city and you specialise in these wonderful office buildings that we're surrounded by. So why are offices so important? Well offices are important as a place of gathering, um, a social place as well as a place to be productive and innovative and to work together as teams. Mm. Um, and I think, I think that's we're increasingly seeing, as we've come out of lockdown, the value in some of these aspects, yeah. um, and we're re-evaluating them. The importance of being um, innovative as an architect in this world is, is essential, because we, in terms of space planning inside, making spaces that are comfortable and almost like a domestic environment, but encouraging a sense of work. Um, is, is an important aspect of the design. 
Amazing. And you've spoken about being innovative as an architect. So how has kind of your role as an architect changed and your briefs changed over the past 10 years or so? Well, I think you see um, office working used to be quite big open plan in the last um, previous 10 years, 20 years, um, with a lot of similar layouts and identical layouts. So you could almost just sit at one desk and another and there'd be no very little personality. Mm. I think now uh, increasingly office space has become much more bespoke and and um, people are feeling that they can work in a in a in a, a bench seat at a, 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 a coffee table yeah. or they can sit at a desk or they can um, sit in an armchair or they can have a conference meeting um, in a small area. They don't need to necessarily be into big hangar spaces like mm. dealing trading floors yeah. that used to be around. I think um, that those those days have gone in a way. Yeah. yeah, amazing. And how important is the environment when you come into these sorts of briefs? Absolutely essential. I mean, it's just it's so important to make inviting, pleasant uh, places which feed the soul and the senses I mean that, that's we're all human we we have eyes nose and ears we we feed off our environment and um, it's really essential that, that environment is tailored to being productive and um, towards the task or the the job at hand yeah yeah and so some some office designs you find increasingly atrium spaces mm. sub atrium spaces just green areas um, as part of the design. So you might get very tall buildings. We've, there's some examples on uh, Bishopsgate where we've got very tall buildings. They're almost like villages in yeah. themselves. So they layer them vertically rather than okay. horizontally. So you might have on the 10th floor a whole suite of pharmacies, uh, or pharmacies uh, and doctor, doctor surgeries and um, a gym and um, legal supports you know <laughs> as if you were going to the to the high street or to um, another part of the city but it's vertical and that's because we're we've now built the city to be very dense and um, so density is an important thing in cities and um, if we take away the density we don't have a city <laughs> yeah so it's it's, we, it's learning to adapt and use the city in a way not just the new buildings but the old buildings as well yeah, so when you have a city like London that is so dense, especially the city of London that is just office spaces, how do you incorporate these green spaces for pollinators? That's a very good question. I mean, it's absolutely essential that we create environments for the natural world. And um, this space, for example, we're in here, Finsbury Circus, mm. is a fabulous space. I mean, it's an elliptical space, historical, laid out by Lutchens and earlier. Um, well, implemented by Lutchens, but laid out much earlier in 1700s. And uh, underneath us is Crossrail, and yeah. Crossrail had uh, had taken over the space and done their digging, and now it's been returned. So now there's a new plan by the city to try and invest in the landscape and make it more attractive. And hopefully, I think pollination will be a, a, an important theme of making the landscape attractive. Um, so not just green plants, but flowering, um, and deciduous plants as well. That would be really exciting to see. Yes, yeah. And I think um, there are other spaces in the city which we, we don't really know about. And I think more and more these things are becoming charted because they're being valued as a space. I mean, I think people will find that they can work in them. Mm. They, they don't have to be in the office building. They could be in the office building within a few minutes, but they could be working out here as well and um, that would be good for their health and well-being and for, um, for the use of the spaces as yes, well. Yes, several benefits. Yes, yeah, yeah. So looking around here, we have several different types of buildings, including the Gherkin over there right in the distance. So why has there been such a change in materials in the buildings used? Well, I, it's a very good question because it's all about sustainability in our environment and um, increasingly I think architects are beginning to question the massive use of glass mm. in buildings. I mean it's, a, it's obviously economic uh, because you can reproduce exactly the same profile and form 
of uh, sheet of glass uh, and cover a building very quickly and um, economically. Um, it's economic in design terms too because it's all repetitive. But um, in the long term for street spaces, I think one has to kind of think about the, the built environment at street level. Some of these more masonry buildings that we're surrounded by here in Finsbury Circus, which is what makes it special, uh, are, are stone and um, they have punched windows and it's, a, it's quite a different way of working as an architect in a way. You're working with proportion, you're forced to think about the scale of an opening relative to another and en making entrances and things and, and, and I think that's an important thing in terms of longevity of a building. So these buildings are made to last for a very long time and perhaps the glass buildings you see the glass will come up, have to be replaced after 30 years as the units fail. Um, so they're, they're inherent in, in built um, questions um, in yeah. some of the modern glass buildings, yeah. Uh, so we've spoken about masonry buildings and we've spoken about the use of glass. Now how do we incorporate a sort of green wall into those spaces? Are we able to do that? Well, uh, there is plenty of good examples now in the city. They're investing in big green walls um, across the city. Uh, there's one at uh, Fenchurch Street, for example, which is a very fine example, where there's a big wall. Um, mm. uh, and the walkie-talkie, for example, is nearby. And um, that's a very modern glass building, um, which has a roof garden within it as well at the top level. Uh, so, yes, I think architects are really embracing the idea of engaging landscape, um, whether it be green walls or roofs or atrias, whatever they are, they're trying to do that. But I think the green wall is a particularly attractive one because it appeals to everyone uh, and hopefully can to pollinators too. Hi, uh, so we're here with Dusty Gedge, who is the president of the Federation of Green Rooms all over Europe. But we're here in London, which is your hometown. Yep. And we have the most beautiful panoramic views surrounding us of London. But what's more exciting is that we're up on a roof covered in plants. So what are we looking at here? Well, this is a green roof. Mm. It's what is known as an extensive green roof. This is a, a sedum extensive green roof, which is also combined with solar panels. And um, this has been really put up for environmental benefits and particularly for biodiversity. Yeah. Um, and the biodiversity where, which drew, drove that in the early days was a, a bird called the Black Red Star, which is a protected species, which actually is found on this roof and is found you know, all over the city of London. Amazing. So what is it that's so special about this roof in particular? Well, this roof represents, um, I, I think it's about, there's probably 300 roofs like this in the city and over London, there's actually about 1.5 million square metres of roofs like this, as opposed to roof gardens. Okay. Roof gardens are where people go and they're more garden-esque. These mm. are more like natural dry grasslands. And what's really important about these is actually they're very, very good at storing rainwater. Okay. They're very, very good at helping cool down the city. But I got involved in this because of nature and actually what they're really, really good at is supporting pollinators. Wonderful, well, that's yeah. why we're here. Exactly. Yeah. So what kind of pollinators do we expect to see on these sorts of green spaces and this roof in particular? Well, I mean, I don't know specifically in this roof because I don't, I haven't looked at this roof, it's not one I'm familiar with, but there's a whole range of um, mason bees, solitary bees, solitary wasps that I have actually witnessed on roofs. And in fact, pollinators are not just actually bees. Um, you know, the other day I actually saw for the first time officially, I did see one about 15 <laughs> years ago, officially a small blue butterfly, which historically is very, very rare in London, but we suspect there's quite a lot because of the green roos, because they like a plant called um, kidney vetch, which is actually very, very prevalent on a lot of green roos all over London. Um, I found one actually in 2005 down in Deptford on a green roof, but I didn't photograph it and all the experts said to me, no, it can't be there, but I filmed one on a green roof in Barnet um, earlier this year with solar panels actually, and sooner or later I'm going to write a blog about it, but um, yeah. So incredible, so we're already seeing a massive difference in the biodiversity because of green roofs like this. So how easy is it to implement green roofs like this over the city of London? Right, first of all, we have a, in, in, in London we have a policy, the GLA has a policy for green roofs, which okay. is a kind of expectation that new developments have green roofs. And boring, boring policy, but gradually down now, all the 32 boroughs, 
Okay. Last year, I think it was Bromley and Redbridge finally adopted that because that's how it does. It feels that. So basically, there are green roofs in every single London borough through new developments. Yeah. Okay. Now the majority of them mm. are in the inner London boroughs because there's been a lot of regeneration. So the City of London is number one. Tower Hamlets, Greenwich, Lewisham, which is my borough, <laughs> which was one of the front runners. I like to celebrate Lewisham. <laughs> Big on that up one. Lewisham. Yeah. And then you know Camden, Islington, Lambeth. Um, one of the one of the one of the smallest boroughs with, in inner London, which doesn't have many green roofs, is the Royal Borough of Chelsea and Kensington, because actually they don't have a lot of development there. Yeah, oh, okay. so that's kind of unique to to that. But actually now Barnet's got a lot of green roofs. You know, Hillingdon's getting a lot of green roofs, and so in London mm. there is a lot of green roofs going on. And when you compare that to the rest of the country, uh, London is the capital of the United Kingdom in terms of green roofs. However, that's new developments. The great thing about central London, and specifically the city of London, the way we build buildings in the city of London mm. is, and we've mapped this and it's, it's verifiable, that 32% of the roof space in central London, and probably about 38 in the city of London, could be retrofitted with a green roof like this tomorrow. Tomorrow. Wow. Without any structural um, process because we build a lot of roofs in the city of London and central London with paving slabs and shingle. Okay. You remove the roof, the paving slab and shingle, mm. and you replace it with the equivalent weight. You don't have to do any structural uplift, <laughs> and it's actually 120 kgs per square meter if you really want to know. Oh, wow. Which means you could actually make the city of London one great big nature reserve. Wouldn't that be? The dream. You know, 32 percent. 32 percent tomorrow. So yeah. Why don't we? Well, um, unlike other cities that have um, uh, green roof policies, like London, also have like incentive incentive processes to retrofit. And unfortunately, it's very very difficult for the GLA to raise revenue to be able to then fund that. And that's yeah. fair because actually the city of London has got other things it needs its revenue for. Yeah. So it doesn't ra raise revenue in the same way that the city of Stuttgart does or Paris does. So until we can find some kind of incentivization mechanism, mm. um, it's very difficult. But however, I am aware of some, some um, blue chip companies and real estate companies actually retrofitting in the city, small, 40, 20 meters um, type of green roof like this, um, because it helps with their um, environmental reporting if they're on the FT. Um, and it's not sort of greenwash, it's like they, they are doing it genuinely. Amazing. So how does London compare to the other European cities that, that you work in? Well, I, I, as a president, um, <laughs> as a president, I know a lot about what goes on in Europe. Um, if you compare us to non-German speaking countries, because the okay. Germans have been doing it for a very, very long time. So mm -hmm. no, nobody's going to have as many green roofs as, <laughs> as Berlin. So the top cities actually are Basel, Stuttgart, Linz, right? It was in Austria, yeah. Now they've been doing it, Lint started in 1984, so they've been doing it a long time. long time. We started really in 2000, but really in 2008. So London is unique actually in the world. It's one of the only cities in the world that delivers green roofs through the planning system with no incentives. Mm -hmm. And we're actually, we're actually probably about outside of, um, sorry, outside of the German speaking countries, we're probably about seventh in the whole of Europe. But actually, if you took away the cities that give incentives, we'd be in the top two. When we start to look at where people go on roofs, oh, it's got to be very manicured. And we need a mix of manicured and unmanicured. Yeah. But some of the landscape architects are starting to get that. I'm seeing some schemes coming up. Certainly Wells Fargo, which is right behind me, has got a kind of feel of that as well. And that was only installed last year. And I've been on that a lot over the lockdown. And it's, it's, it's not my kind of green roof, but you go, it would be really churlish not to say it's a really nice green roof. It is a nice green If you know what I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like Hannah Street down there, yeah. it's not mine. It looks like a nice formal park, but... It's a beautiful one it's a and beautiful some people thing. are going to love yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Well, I'm really excited to see how this develops over the years, especially post-lockdown when people wanting to get back in touch with nature in the city. So thank you very much for talking to us today. And uh, I'm excited to see what happens next. Yeah, well, I'd like to just say if I may, because it is about pollinating together and really... In London, the biggest thing you can do for pollination in London is to deliver green roofs on all those roofs that can take them. And there's a little bit of expertise needed to know about that, but pollinating together for London could have a massive impact if they can get people to 
to engage with that process. I'm here with Colin Buttery, who is Director of Open Spaces for the City of London Corporation. Um, and so that, that involves Epping Forest and Burnham Beaches and Tower Bridge, which I'm quite envious of. I think that's a nice thing to do. Um, but certainly we're here at Greyfriars and we've been looking at the garden here at Greyfriars which is really good for pollinator planting. Um, it's nice to see. Um, so there are a couple of questions really. The, the Council Protection of Royal England ran a survey, I don't know if you've seen it, in, a, in April, asking people what they thought about open spaces um, since COVID. And the 59% of those people that responded were saying how much more they value green spaces now. Um, and so I was wondering how much that might impact on anything that you're going to do in the future. Yeah, well, I, I think uh, the whole COVID pandemic has um, raised the profile of open spaces and how much people enjoy those open spaces. Um, so again, we've done similar surveys and discovered that on average, we're getting about 350% increase on the number of people visiting open spaces. Yeah. Uh, and that's not, not just, you know, the big properties like Hampstead Heath yeah. and, you know, the really yeah. big high profile properties, but even small gardens like this one yeah. here at Greyfriars um, have seen a huge increase in the number of people visiting. And really interestingly, how much people appreciate the open spaces. So we are very keen to build on this. Uh, and try and find ways in which we can work with the community to uh, recognise how important those open spaces yeah. are. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, again, the cities uh, within the square mile uh, owns uh, about 170 small open spaces. Uh, and over a period of time, through the Biodiversity Action Plan, uh, we are gradually improving uh, the type of planting that we have. Uh, so we are focusing on things like uh, native species as being the primary way of helping wildlife. Uh, and certainly all of the planting here at Greyfriars and elsewhere, when we have the opportunity to change bedding, and we're looking at things like perennials, shrubs and mm. tree planting, uh, we are looking at species that are supporting pollinator species. So, um, you know, in, in terms of things like at this time of year, um, plants that are still flowering um, include the very late flowering things like uh, um, you've got ivies, you've got various yeah. climbers yeah. that are still flowering yeah. uh, and I think that's one of the important things is to have flowering plants throughout the year yes. and those native species tend to be the ones that are most beneficial for wildlife. Yeah, yeah. So yeah it's really important to get that um, spread of flowering across the year isn't it I and mean, it's easy relatively easy in the height of the summer but the early flowering and the late flowering is so important Very for important. pollinators yeah yeah, yeah. so I, I think again if you're if you're looking at things early on in the season things like primroses yeah um, preferably not the hybrids go, go no. for a, a, yeah. a native primrose yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that will be a very early flower that can help the pollinator species early on in the season. Uh, in the city we, we work very closely with the beekeepers yeah. uh, because that they uh, obviously want the, the bees to have as many different uh, sources of nectar and pollen as possible. Yeah. Uh, and so we are looking at things like uh, tree species as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, lime trees traditionally yeah. have been very good yeah. for bees. Uh, but actually, if you think of uh, some of the larger shrubs like uh, hawthorn, hawthorn, you know, yeah. called a May tree yeah. because it flowers yeah. in May. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. there's a month covered. If you've got a, a nice yeah. sized hawthorn tree that's yeah. flowering, uh, that will be covered in insects and, and really good from a biodiversity perspective. Yeah. Uh, our, our initiative around biodiversity is not a uh, financially led uh, yeah. initiative. It's very much about in, enhancing biodiversity in the city. Uh, but interestingly, our money can stretch further. 
Yeah. Uh, once we've got those perennial beds established, some of the shrubs, you know, you might be on a 12 to 15 year cycle yeah. for changing that shrub bed, which is so much better than going in three times a year to yeah. change yeah. Uh, annual planting. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, I think it, it works really well for us. Yeah, good. And it's nice to see the way it's going. Thank you ever so much. Really well, it's, appreciate it's been really nice it. seeing you uh, on this beautiful September yeah. um, afternoon. It's, <laughs> yeah. it, it is very special in yeah. the city. Thank you.